Hello, good afternoon. Thank you for coming. When uh, there are many things, very interesting things to do in Barcelona than staying here listening to me. Um, um, yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I have to say that uh, I feel a little bit like an outsider here because I'm a type designer. I'm not a programmer, although sometimes I have to program some small scripts for producing fonts, but uh, I'm mainly, mainly a, a type designer. So, and um, yeah, hope that you will find some of the information I will deliver this afternoon interesting for, for you. Um, I beg your pardon if some of you feel that uh, my, 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 my conversation or my, my lecture will be at a very low level, but I will try to, to explain different things, different thoughts about, about type design and typography. So I, I, I understand that it's a challenge to be here to, to deliver a lecture in, in Drupal because you are a very expertise audience and I'm just from another field. Maybe that's something that I will, I will say will be very amazing for me, but maybe totally boring for you. So I beg your pardon for that too. Okay, first of all, I will introduce myself. Uh, that's me, the small one. I'm Andreu Valius. I am a type designer. I love trekking, traveling, riding on my mountain bike. I also like drawing letters, of course. And this, this is my city, uh, welcome to Barcelona. The place, this is the place where, where I live and also the place where I work. I have my office more or less in the Gracia area, in, in the neighborhood of Gracia. And Type Republic is the name of my studio and also the, the, the place where I distribute my typefaces. I have a type, small, very, very small type foundry and Type Republic is the name. This is the place where I work. I spend most of my, my days here. And uh, I work both on commission projects on, of type design, and also I try to have enough time to do my own personal projects. So I have, maybe this is not good because you get not so, so much money, but uh, yeah, with doing your own projects, you can do whatever you want, and you get also the, the, the chance to research, do some research, and do the sort of work that someone you never will be commissioned. Commission. I also teach part-time, and uh, I teach typography and type design in here in Barcelona, and also give some workshops on type design and typography in different places. This is uh, in Chile, for example. And uh, well, I started uh, working as a graphic designer, not as a type designer, because I studied graphic design, and that was some years ago quite a long time ago, I think. And uh, yeah, I designed a lot of flyers and posters for festivals like Primavera Sound. That was one of the first editions of Primavera Sound. And also for nightclubs in Barcelona. I was very fond of music and uh, I just started as a graphic designer designing this sort of stuff. But I soon became more and more interested in typography and type design, so when the, these all things appeared. I was really amazed, and I started to explore the possibilities that this all Max could do with type design. I have to say that what I got was really horrible, but uh, in the meantime, I was also learning. That was the early 90s, and I, I decided to get more into it, so uh, I just started designing typefaces. So I became a type designer, and you may ask what a type designer is. Well, basically, a type designer is someone that designs typefaces, but also someone that can, can help graphic designers to, to do type work or, or, the, or the labor with type projects. So yeah, a type designer is really a nerd. Some, someone that uh, can, be, can take care of these sort of things when they see, for example, this S upside down and say, ah, what's this? No? These sort of mistakes make type designers get very angry. Also, type designers is someone that takes care of these things. When, when he sees a new logo redesign, this has been largely discussed along these weeks, and uh, it's about typography. The look of a, of a logotype, of a, of a brand, of a mark, a trademark, it's uh, 
a problem of type sometimes. And uh, we can see that designer Frode Hallan decided to redesign the design of Google. And uh, here you have a, a short explanation of what he did. He basically improved the shapes of letters. That's something really basic. But you can see the difference, how, for example, the, the, the logo that you can see of Google now is really uh, stretch and narrow, and you can see G, L, E, too much uh, stick together. And uh, yeah, I think it's a good improvement, even though, even though if you look at, the, at the, the shape of letter G, uppercase G, looks more thicker than the rest of the, of the letters. Sorry, the other ways. So the, upper, the lower case looks bigger, looks thicker than the letter G. So type designers are professionals that care about type and can help designers and also big companies to do the proper things when they are using type. And yes, a type designer is someone that is able to publish this sort of pictures on Facebook, no? Cats reading books on historical type. Okay, I will show you some, some of my work. Uh, this is not a portfolio talk, so I'm not going to, to, to talk more about my work, but I just to like to introduce my, my work briefly to you in order that you can see what a type designer is doing, at least what a type designer in Barcelona is, is doing. Uh, for example, this is one of my first typefaces in, for reading text, for literary text uh, books. Uh, this is the result of a research on Spanish uh, typography in the 18th century, and is intended for, for mainly for reading from literary books. It's not the same designing typefaces for literary books, so for, for novels, for poetry, whatever, than if you design a typeface for newspaper or for a magazine. It's something completely different. So the uses of type depend on the context that they are going to be used. This is another typeface, and it's called Carmen, and is uh, is also part of a research of 19th century French uh, typography, French and Spanish. It's a kind of French and a Spanish connection because that was the time of Napoleon when he was in Spain, and there was a lot of influence of the French typography. So I find history can be a, a very good starting point, not as a revival, not as a, a way to digitize things, but as a way to to look how things were in the old times and how these old things can be useful today when we, we can do contemporary design. But I wanted to get some sort of elegance and extravaganza with this typeface, so this is Carmen, but at the same time Victoria's Secret, the, the Lingerie uh, company, uh, got in touch with me because they, they wanted to use Carmen for, for the, the communication of the of the of the, the products and they um, they wanted to design they wanted me to they commissioned me to design a family improving the typeface in a more sensual way so what i did was uh, design different styles that were for victoria's secret for their their communication uh, products that tried to be, the surface tried to be a little bit more refined, more elegant, more sexy. I include a lot of different ligatures. This ligature with G, I, for example, C, I, or the double G, for example. So it tries to be a, a specific uh, typeface for them. Barna is uh, more intended for text, technical text. If you think in um, company, information, data, signal systems, all these sort of things, more technical. Also, you can see this typeface here in the conventional, um, uh, yeah, the, the, here displays the International Conventional Center. This uh, typeface was also made by me some years ago. And uh, this is another typeface I've made for University of La Rioja. This is a website, uh, sorry, no, this is a typeface <laughs> that was intended to work for a screen that was for Belgacom. Belgacom is the, um, is the telephone company in Belgium. So I designed a, the typeface that could be used not only for print, but also for the website and all the, the, the devices that they, are, they have. Also, I have been lately interested in multilingualism and in multicultural uh, typography. So this is Al-Andalus. It's a typeface that combines Arabic 
and Latin together so they can be harmonized in the same page or in the same website, whatever. And uh, is inspired in the Nashk style, the Nashk Arabic style. And uh, yeah, it's an, in order to, to, could, to, to be able to use both scripts in the same, in the same place. Also, in another stage, I have been working on Andalusian. Andalusian is the, the Maghrebian style that was developed in Al-Andalus, in Spain, in the Middle Ages. So this is also part of, a, of a research. I think that graphic designers and type design could give, um, uh, should give answers to the different needs of our global world. And I think that uh, typography can, can provide uh, tools in order, that, uh, in order to connect cultures and, and make cultures more visible. Well, you can see more of my work in, in the website, afropublic.com. And now let's start about the topic of today. You know, I started with the question, what's your type? And uh, I will now give a specific solutions, but uh, yeah, um, I will... I, I, I don't want to, to give a specific uh, a recipe or something to say this is, has to be used this way or that way. I will try to explain typography, how to use typography in a more general and general way. You know? At least I will try to get some, some thoughts uh, and considerations about the use of type. The first consideration about about typefaces are the amount of typefaces that we have. We, there are a lot of typefaces now in the world, maybe more in Latin than in other scripts, like Devanagari or Gyerakana uh, uh, or Chinese or, or Arabic, for example. But we have lots of Latin typefaces that we can select, that we can choose. And um, the question that first arises is, uh, do we really need so many typefaces? There are, uh, there are designers that think that with 10 or maybe 20 typefaces, it's enough to solve any sort of communication problem. But if you go a little bit into it, we, we, can, we can think about uh, the shoes. We, we, we all use shoes, and there are different kinds of shoes. It depends on, on what we like, the type of shoes we, we prefer, um, and also the use of the choose. No? So if we are invited to the wedding, probably we will go to buy a pair of nice new shoes. But if we want to buy to play football, we will buy a specific shoes that will apply for this sort of sport. If we go hiking into the mountains, we will get a, a good pair of boots. So it all will depend on uh, the context of use of the shoes. So each pair of shoes are made and design specifically for a specific purpose and according to um, a specific use. So it, it also happens with typography. When we design typefaces, what we think is about a, a, specific, uh, a specific context. So there are tools that have been designed to be used daily, every day, and as a standard way of using it. We also have Helvetica, for example. And instead, there are shoes that are designed specifically for uh, a very special occasion. For example, when we want to play any specific sort of a sport. It all depends on the context. And context of use is very important when looking at, uh, for a typeface, when we have to choose a typeface for a specific project that can, can fit specifically for a specific sort of communication. So it also happens with, with wine. Um, a smart gourmets are able to choose the specific wine that will fit for specific dishes. And uh, let's go to the, to the shoes, for example, again. And if we look at these shoes, and we, we want to choose a typeface that can fit for, for these shoes, for example, um, imagine that we, we want to choose a, a, a typeface or, or a name for this choose, and we choose Bodoni, for example. Bodoni is a very elegant typeface, but um, yeah, it has a very a strong contrast. And this contrast makes this typeface more ref refined, elegant, a little bit sophisticated, and, and the boots are not sophisticated, so maybe this is not the typeface that we should use. 
This is a Chanel Roundhound and is based on uh, copper, copper plate calligraphy. And yes, yeah, Chanel is also very elegant, but here it, it doesn't really apply, it doesn't really fit with this pair of boots. So we have the same problem. Also, maybe that's the, this typeface has a very feminine uh, mood. Yes, this is Impact, and Impact is, bold, is a bold sans serif and is more intended for headlines. So it's a more display typeface, and maybe here this typeface could fit better than the, the, others, the other two. Perhaps it's different if we use uppercase or we, we, we use lowercase. With lowercase, we have more variety of shapes. With uppercase, we have a very a strong meaning, so it's more aggressive, it's more strong, it's stronger than this case. So it depends on what we want to communicate. Uppercase or lowercase will be better, it depends. If we, if we select a different pair of shoes for dancing, for example, we can see that this sort of impact, this sort of typeface doesn't fit, doesn't work. In this case, maybe it's better if we use a bodoni that gives this poetic feeling, or even better, the Snell calligraphic that uh, could give some more dynamism in this pair of shoes. So each typeface provides a unique voice or a character and personality that can be applied to a, a specific uh, project. Typefaces has different values, and I think this is important. When we have to, to look for a typeface, sorry, my English is getting a little bit sticky. So when we have to look for a typeface, we have to take into account that Every typeface has different dimensions or different values. The staffing value that has to do with the shapes of letters, the emotional value that has to do with the soul, the things that, uh, that can be perceived through the shapes of letters, and the functional part that is really important because typography is meant to be read. So we have to read typefaces so they have to be in a certain way functional. We have to use them so they have to be Functional in order also to have a, a good user experience. But designers, sometimes they don't consider this. They just go to the menu of the, the laptop or the computer and just select whatever they like, and they don't care much about the, the, the strength of typography when, communication, when communicating. So when we talk about the personality and the character, we refer basically to aesthetic values. The shape of letters provides aesthetic uh, values that uh, we can relate with certain attributes and that can be applied to a specific sort of communication. For example, this is Carmen Fiesta. It's one of the display versions of the Carmen family that I showed you before. And um, yeah, this typeface has a very strong personality. You, can, you cannot use it everywhere. So it has a very specific use. It's very difficult to use this sort of typefaces that, has, that they have this uh, very strong personality. But for example, I will give you a sample of use of this typeface that I, I think that is really well used. So it's, uh, it has been selected for, for a cover of a book about uh, the Damascus uh, people in uh, the Lucha Libre in, in Mexico. So I think in this case, this typeface is a good Selection it communicates really uh, very well what they, they, the designer wants to communicate. So I think it's a good sample of use. So each typeface has a very unique character and personality. So when we look at Helvetica, is Helvetica, as you know, it's a very standard typeface. It's everywhere. It's overused, and um, and sometimes uh, yeah, Helvetica can work, but not always. Helvetica works properly. And this is Shelly. Shelly is a dynamic typeface. It's based on calligraphy. And uh, it's also elegant. And it provides a very young and fresh, charming, and it's uh, a positive feeling also. 
Futura is based on geometry. It was designed in the in the late 20s and uh, it was one of the 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 myths of the Bad Bauhaus. And uh, but Futura has this elegant and modern look. Uh, it provides a rational uh, feeling. It's not a warm typeface. It's a little bit cool, but uh, it can work when we want to communicate this sort of uh, simplicity, rational uh, way of delivering communication. And Carmen is a typeface that, as you, I, I told you before, it's based on this French-Spanish connection at the beginning of the 19th century. And uh, it evolves some sort of romanticism and is also a little bit sensual and, and also elegant. Baskerville, for example, is a transitional typeface and it was designed in England by John Baskerville in the late 18th century and it has a very traditional look, but it's not, well, maybe we could say it, it's an old style, not really traditional, and uh, it's very good for reading, for reading books. It's one of the most used typefaces for novels or for, for text, for reading text. And this is the personality of Barna, Barna Stencil, that is a display typeface, but uh, yeah, it has this, this sort of charm and uh, urban feeling. So each typeface provides a unique voice and a unique way to say things. And uh, I could say that type, in a certain way, it's the voice of the message. So when I speak to you, I can be happy, I can be uh, frightened, or I can be sad. And this sort of emotion that I feel myself can be delivered to you. You can, you can perceive this because of my tone of voice. When we are writing with typography, how can we be emotional? How can we um, convey this emotional part of the language? So when we write, it's not the same as when I am speaking. So we have to rely on the shapes of letters. We have to rely on the design of these letters. No? Because type, at the end, represents language. And language is the way we deliver ideas and knowledge and whatever. So, yeah, so there are certain limitations if we compare the spoken language with the written language when we use typography. Sometimes we have to express our emotions doing this when we write an email to a friend in order that the friend don't get uh, angry or so on. So we could express different feelings when we, we are using typefaces and we don't need necessary to do these sort of things. So type is the voice of the message. And I will try to put you another example. Maybe that the sentence, I love you, is the most used sentence in the cinema for ages. And from my point of, my point of view in typography, there are as many ways to say I love you as typographies. Or maybe there are as many typographies as the ways you can say I love you. It depends on the person, it depends on the context. In this case, it depends on the film. So we can say I love you in many, many different ways. So, and it depends always in, in the sort of situation that we are delivering. So maybe we can say I love you in Futura, using Futura. And be serious, rational, modern, simple, honest, humble, and very minimal. It's a very simple way to say, I love you. But we can love, we can love in impact, using impact, and be passionate, excited, exaggerated, grandiloquent, sensationalist. It's like uh, saying, uh, I love you, don't go, stay with me. And we can also say I love you using Elizabeth. Elizabeth is a very polite, very smart, romantic, sensitive typeface. So this is another way to say the same thing. 
And also we can say I love you using fracture. And uh, yeah, fracture gives this very strong dramatic feeling. Look at the, at the shape of letters. The counters of the letters are really, really, really narrow. And uh, yeah, they are like wanted to, to go away, to escape from this, from this letter. So maybe that it's better run away when someone takes to I love you with this typeface. But also we can love with Carmen and be quiet, be warm, be tender, maybe. And of course we can love with Helvetica and be stable, secure, secure in our love decisions, doing always the right thing. I think that making love in Helvetica is no risk at all and really boring. And yeah, even we can love using Comic Sans, why not? Maybe that nobody is going to take us seriously. But it can fit very well for certain situations. Because at the end, type is the voice of the message, is the way to say, I love you. It's, there are different ways to say you. You can say it like lying to your partner, or, or maybe yet you are saying it very truly and trustfully. At, so on, you know what I mean. Because at the end, the, the, the logo, when we think about logotypes, uh, a logotype is really an image, it's just a shape. Uh, it's a combination of letters and it's an image. No? We say, it is said that an image is worth a thousand of words, but a word is also an image. So in brand design, the selection of, type, of a typeface is very important because it's not the same. We are not talking about the same, the same company. We are not talking about the same shop or whatever it, habitat it is, because every typeface gives a difference. Maybe it's a small difference, but sometimes it can be a huge difference. Okay, but one of the most important things, one of the most important values in typography and type design, when we are designing typefaces, is the functional values. Well, this has to do with the purpose of the typeface. It has to do with uh, the context. Uh, is it for reading? And is, if, it, if it, this typeface is going to be for reading, is for newspapers, is for books, is for signal systems in the road or in a museum? It's totally different context, so we have to take into account which is the, the, the use of the typeface in order to, to get the, the best choice and get, at the same time, the better user experience. If it goes for a screen, we have to take into account the resolution, we have to take into account how many devices this typeface is going to, to be seen. Maybe that we need a large family, maybe we need only one weight in a phone, uh, do we need other scripts, maybe like Arabic, because we, we have a, to, to deliver a communication, to communicate something that has to be in different languages and also in different scripts? So there are a lot of things to take into account when selecting, when choosing a typeface. Well, type, as you know, it uh, represents sound. It's the, the, represent, the representation of language. And... Uh, when you write uh, in type, uh, at the, in the old times, uh, it was used to, to do with this pre-manufactured letter. So it was like a, a different it's a system of modular system of combining uh, letters. And um, yeah, because at the end, as I said before, type represents language. And uh, from a functional perspective, type conveys ideas, concepts, messages. And throughout uh, this combination of text, so we communicate meaning throughout text. So it has to be readable and it has to be legible. So that's a very important part of the use of typography. It has to be functional. It has to, to be read. This is a, a, a definition of typography from Robin Brinkhurst that says that the typography exists to honor content. So that's a, the main goal of type design and typography to, to deliver the message, to, to communicate. 
And this is another interesting definition when Helen Lapton says that typography is what language looks like. So when we see uh, a logo, uh, we look at the typefaces and we, and we get some sort of information, not only the, da the data, the, the, the information of the name, but also the emotional values, the, the, uh, yeah, the, the attributes of the company, whatever, can be delivered through typography. So at the end, type has to be read. And um, if, you, if you have to uh, classificate, make a, a very basic, very basic classification of text according to the user experience about the use of type, we could uh, establish this sort of, uh, of difference. There are typefaces that are good for text, and there are typefaces that are good at, uh, at big sizes, that's the display typefaces. So at big sizes, we can perceive, we can see the shapes of letters, the, the value of this, this emotional value. And this is what um, provides the personality, the character of a typeface. While in the other side, when we look for legibility, we have to look at typefaces that uh, has these functional, functional values. But when talking about functionality, we have to take into account that um, we not only design typefaces for print, we have to, most of the times, these typefaces has to be used for the web, so uh, you have to decide to make a lot of decisions when designing typefaces, but also you have to make a lot of decisions when composing, when using these typefaces according to the difference, to the different format that the, the reader will have. So does the same typeface will apply for all these typefaces, for all these screens or all these devices? Yeah, maybe the, the same typeface can apply, but not the composition of the text. We have to, this, to the, make different designs or make a design that can be adapted to these uh, devices. So for example, when we, we're talking about readability, about how many characters uh, should be composed in a line in order to make a text more or less easy to read, we have to take into account more or less the same conventions that we have in print. The same conventions in print more or less apply to a screen. Not always, but in the, in, when we are composing text and we look for the, um, the ease of reading, the yeah, the way to read easily, we have to take into account, into account which are the conventions of using type in print, in paper. For example, here we can see that there are two columns, but maybe the, the space between the lines, the leading on the, the left column is not so good for a good um, reading. Also, in this case, if you have lines that are too large, uh, the reader will miss the, the, the way along the line, so it's not also easy to read. Um, Emil Rudder said that uh, a line that has between 50 and 60 characters per line, it's easy to read, it's okay, but there are other people that say that maybe it's a little bit more. Uh, so there is not a recipe, but there is like a convention, a way of reading that makes that people read the way they read and they read easily. And we designers have to take into account these conventions in order to make things easy. Of course, we can risk and we can make things uh, going further. But uh, if we want people to read in a certain way, we have to take into account this. There are uh, different tools, maybe that you know them, that uh, you can test, you can, in this type tester, for example, you can select different typefaces and make different uh, sort of uh, variations so you can look how they look for your website, for example. So it's important to get a good relationship between the, the, the length of the line, which is the column, and the number of, uh, of letters and also the size of letters. So in this, uh, here, for example, we can see that about the leading, the variation of leading makes a big difference about reading. Also, the space, the spacing among characters makes a good difference. So 
of course, we cannot do this sort of things, so this is quite exaggerating, but I, I want to say that there are certain conventions that has to be taken into account in order to make a text a good, uh, a good experience for when reading. Um, this, for example, is a, a digital book, and um, we can see that the, the lines are too large, so it's not so easy to read. And here we have, this is an, a book in a, an iPad, and it's really a bad example of using text. There has a lot of uh, white spaces among words, and this makes the column not, uh, not really a good, a good image of, of it. It's just like uh, something that is uh, dissolving. We can see a lot of white spaces that are too much in this case. But here we have a good sample, for example, of, of using text in a, in a website. Or here, for example, or in this case. So we have to get a good balance between the size of the letter, the line, the, the, the number of letters in a line, and the space between the lines. So there are some times that, because of the functional things, typefaces are designed specifically for, for different needs, for different purposes, as can be, for example, typefaces that has been designed to fit uh, the requirements of the children's reading books. This is Sassoon, primary Sassoon. Some typefaces has been designed specifically to solve technological limitations. This is, for example, in print, the case of Bell Centennial. It was a typeface that was designed for the, for the telephone agendas. If we look at these typefaces a little bit closely, uh, a little bit closer, we can see that they have strange holes when the, 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 let, the, 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 the strokes meet. Uh, and that's because uh, this is a typeface that is not intended for display for big sizes. This is a typeface to be used at six point, what, maybe eight, nine point, but not more than that. And uh, this is uh, because this, this is, these uh, holes are called ink, ink traps, and uh, they are made in order to avoid the amount of ink that accumulate where the strokes join together. So when we see this typeface print at a very small size, nothing happens, or at least the, the shape of letters are more or less okay. So it's important that when we go smaller in size, when we use a typeface, we have to take into account the counters. So we need to uh, select typefaces that have open counters. For example, it's important that the, the letter A, for example, or letter C, the, uh, the, the strokes don't meet together, don't join together too much. Otherwise, at the small sizes, visually, they look like an O instead of a C, for example. So that's something that has also, it's, um, also has to do when we apply for low resolution screen. So when we, we have to, when it has to do with pixels uh, at low resolutions, we don't have pixels enough for these small sizes. So we have to uh, take also into account these things that were taken into account when designing typefaces for print, for paper. So there are some connections between these. So when we think about good typefaces for a screen, we had to take into account that we need a small contrast outlines. And in this case, well, let's go by the large each hay. So we need that the, the, the x hay is large enough so at the small sizes it can even look good. Otherwise, it disappears and it's not so legible. We also need to have open counters. That's the case of the Bell Centennial for print, so the counter forms can be as much as open as possible in order that 
uh, the, the, the whole shape of the letter is well defined. And of course, we need typefaces that has no contrast, or at least very small cont contrast. If we are going to use typefaces in, in a, on a screen in a very big size, there is no problem. We have pixels enough for that. Or if we work in a very uh, good resolution devices, there's not much problem. But if we look at the small sizes, we have to take into account these things. So because when, if you have uh, a typeface like Bodoni, for example, or Dido, uh, the problem is that at the small si sizes, the, the, the contrast of the letters disappear and it breaks. So it makes no, no sense to use these sort of typefaces at these small sizes. We have also to take into account that typefaces are designed as vectorial shapes, as outlines that are made out of vectors. So, but in a, in a screen, we see these uh, outlines with pixels. So it's a different way of, of, of looking at things. Um, and yeah, that's sometimes we need hinting, we need some instructions to make that this process of rasterizing from the outline, from the vectorial shape to something that will be, um, will be seen as a, on a screen uh, in order to, to manage this, this problem of getting a good representation or a good image of a letter from the outline to the, to translate it into, into pixels, in, in a grid of pixels. So this is, for example, how it works with hinting. Hinting are just some instructions that makes, uh, that says to the, to the rasterizer, uh, it doesn't matter which rasterizer, but it says how, according to the outlines, the shape of the letter has to be drawn on, on screen according to the pixels. But uh, there is a problem at this moment, you know that there is no standard on how to deal with fonts on a screen. Uh, that means that at a certain way, we don't have a total control on how the fonts that we design or the fonts that you select uh, will be uh, rasterized or will be seen on, on a screen. So because each operating system contains a text rendering tool, a text rendering engine, and uh, Mac, uh, Mac, for example, has a different uh, render engine that uh, Windows, for example, and even browsers has different ways to, to deal with these things. So um, yeah, text rendering depends on, on all these. No? These are different ways of how uh, Mac or Windows deliver with the render of fonts on, on a screen. No? Cortex uh, is used on Mac and DirectWrite and GDI on Windows. And yeah, but sometimes we can see that there is no standard, there is no perfect way to render fonts on a screen. But as much as uh, monitors are improved, um, this problem will be more or less solved, but uh, that's something that we have to take into account. No? Type, type rendered on the, on the web is the, is the result of many factors, and we have to deal with this, and we have to test, and we have to look at how it looks in this, the different devices. Yeah, you know that Retina Displays has improved the rendering very lar largely and makes the hinting process that was really boring for type designers be something that can be left apart. So it's not so important. But even though it's, uh, it's good to take into account how these things uh, happen. Yeah, when we look typefaces for signal systems, for example, um, we have to take into account the, the, the typeface also because we see them from the distance and uh, uh, we have to, 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 to take into account uh, this more or less the same things that when we, you, when we see on a screen. We need typefaces that has open counters. We have typefaces that has not many, much contrast because we are going to see them from the distance. And, um, and yet it's a very important functional problem this is the phase that was designed especially for, for the, 
the roads in the, the UK. And uh, these are the more, uh, main features uh, when designing this sort of typefaces. Regular stroke, so not many contrasts, having a very large each K, open counters. Uh, the spacing in this case it's quite tight because sometimes we need to put words that are quite long. We can see it in the in this case. The, this is the Dean typeface in in Berlin. Well, sorry, in Germany. Different design and and of course we need to save a space. This is a, another typeface that was designed specifically for for signal systems. And yes, at the end, to conclude, we, we should assume that although we select a nice typeface, the result can be useless if we don't take into account things such as the context that uh, we, are, where we are using this typeface or, or these values that I was talking to you before about the functional the emotional and the aesthetic part of the of the letter. So it's important to be conscious about the communication power of typography in any piece of graphic work or in any piece of communication. It's important that uh, designers, typographers and type designers work together in order to make things more easy. So uh, at the end we are here to, to give some help. So feel free to to ask me if I can help you. And yeah, but we should not only look at type design and typography as something that is just utilitarian, utilitarian tool for communication. I think that moreover, type as a representation of language is a powerful tool that contributes to expand knowledge and culture. And in our, our global world, typography can be a very good way to visualize other scripts and languages and therefore other cultures and uh, a good tool also to bridge, uh, sorry, to build bridges and uh, be more close to other communities, to other cultures and make a world a little bit better and more understandable. So we can see typography also as a tool to convey social and human values. And I think that's all. Thank you so much for your lecture. <laughs> if there is any question, any comment or something? Yeah. Uh, there are, I know that there are books that are print for, for dyslexic people and for special sort of audiences that uh, need some sort of help. You mean printed books? I justify, you say. Most of books are justified. Yeah, that's a way of saving space. When you justify, uh, you save a lot of space. So that's a problem maybe of economy, if we think about uh, from a publisher or editorial point of view. And uh, it also, when you justify, you can get a more compact image of the page. 
so you can get more control on about the spaces among the worlds. Uh, you can more or less get a more uh, visual. Uh, maybe it, it has to be. It, maybe it has to do with convention. So if we think about the the Biblia from Gutenberg, and the, all the the, man, the manuscripts that were in the codex and the old books, the convention was justifying. Uh, so it has also to do with, with that. But justifying text, you can get a better uh, balance of the color of the page. If you have reshet right or reshet left, you have a lot of holes and uh, there is some white space that is not used. So. Uh, sometimes it's better if you justify, sometimes it's better if you made reshet right or reshet left. Yeah, in, the, in the web, I think there is some problems when justifying. It's not so easy to con get so much control on how the white spaces between characters or between words. At this moment, there are some limitations on how to use type on the web. It's going to be delivered, I'm sure, but uh, and there are a lot of possibilities at this moment to, to work on, on with type in, on the web. I, I show some good samples where you can see caps, uh, cap, uh, drop caps and uh, uh, small caps used on the web. Uh, but when justifying, when delivering with the spacing and even the kerning, there are not all the, the browsers support this, some of the coding of the CC, CCS, the styles. I'm not, I'm sorry because I'm not a specialized in, in web design, so I, I cannot talk much about it, but I, I know that there are some limitations in, when using type on the web. In the for the for the web, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I was uh, wondering uh, when I walk around every day, I see the use of Comic Sans quite often, actually, more often than I actually would, would want to. But I was wondering when people um, print things themselves at their homes or uh, signs, putting up signs everywhere, they seem to like the use of Comic Sans quite often. And I was wondering if there's any explanation for it. I think it has to do with the functional part because it's very readable but it lacks aesthetics and maybe emotion. It's used uh, in the wrong way. Uh, actually, it was probably meant to be used in strips uh, or child books, but why is it so like, people seem to like it. Uh, any more explanation about that? No, I have the <laughs> No, I think that any typeface has its place in the world. So even Comic Sans, and yeah, sometimes it's well used, sometimes it's not well used. So um, even the design of Comic Sans sometimes wonders why. And, but uh, no, I, I, I remember I read some, an article that was saying that people choose Comic Sans because it's more readable, more, more legible than other other type phases, but um, I don't know. I don't think that there is a sci scientific uh, <laughs> a study or survey about it. Okay. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. is, there, is there any research or uh, anything that says that particularly maybe one type of font is better for one language versus another one? Um, no, 
let's, for example, uh, we use Latin, Latin, the la Latin alphabet, and we, in the Latin alphabet is used for many languages. So what we really need is that if we are going to not only use English, for example, but we use Czech or Polish, for example, we need a, a phone, a typeface that has all the diacritics that can be used, that will be necessary for this language. So in this case, uh, we have to look for typefaces that has all the diacritics that can be used for this uh, specific language. If we think about in, um, in our global world, and we have to, uh, to, to combine text that has Latin, a Latin language, like can be Spanish, French, English, whatever, and also maybe Arabic, and we have Farsi and uh, Arabic or any language that uses the Arabic script for composing text. What we have to do, and this is something really new, it has happened from the last uh, maybe five, six years, uh, there is the need to harmonize both scripts in terms of proportions, in terms of the color of text on, on paper or on a screen. So it's important that then you have to look for typefaces or type families that they combine uh, Latin, maybe Greek, Cyrillic, Arabic in a very harmonious way, in a balanced way. The problem now is that uh, when you have to, uh, to, de to design, for example, um, um, a book of poetry and you have uh, maybe Cyrillic and, uh, and, uh, and German or, or English and they have to go together sometimes. Uh, well, Cyrillic maybe it's more easy to, to harmonize, but for instance, if you have Arabic or Chinese and, and English, and you have the original text in the other script and the translation in English, uh, you need to get good typefaces that have a good balance between both of the scripts. Because normally you have one font that has the Latin language, and or, or sorry, the Latin script, and another font that comes from another place, another designer, that has a, a more maybe other design, and they don't really fit each other. So at this moment, type designers are very aware of of this sort of uh, multilingual thing and the multicultural thing. And uh, there are some designers that are doing this, this uh, exercise no? to, to, to think about one script, but also think how, what would happen if the, the, the person, the personality, the character of this typeface that has been designed in a specific script, in Latin script, can be applied, can be also uh, applied to another script. I don't know if I have answered your question, but uh, in this case, you have to look for typefaces that combine different scripts in a very um, harmonious way. Sorry? No, there is, there is nothing. You have the Google fonts, for example. They have a, a Noto, I think, that has a lot of, um, has been designed in different scripts. But I think that it has been designed very fast and maybe, I don't know if, if it's, all, it's okay for all the, the scripts. I don't know. I haven't tested all, all the scripts. But there is no engine, nothing that can switch from one thing to the other and in design terms. So you have to go to fonts that are open type fonts and are multi-script. When you have a multi-script font, it means that you have different scripts in the same, within the same font. How many type? You mean scripts yeah. or typefaces? Yeah. Is there a point where it can get confusing if you have too many uh, yeah. yeah. If you mix in a page too many typefaces, 
It means there are a lot of inputs, visual inputs, in, that gets in your eye and gets a little bit uh, disturbing to, for reading. So, I don't know any rule. I think that common sense could say that if you use more than two or three families will be a little bit uh, disturbing. Maybe that if you maybe in a magazine, in a magazine sometimes you have different fonts uh, in use, so you can get a more appealing uh, sort of page. And uh, maybe one good display typeface for typing for headlines, maybe another one for the text, a more functional one, and maybe for captions or maybe for uh, some very small text for the credits of the photographer or whatever you can have a sans serif, for example, or whatever. So maybe three families will be fair enough for a, for a typeface. For example, in Monocle, Monocle is a very, I think it's a very good web design, has a very good web design, and they have three families in use. Okay, thank, thank you very much <laughs> for your patience. And, uh, okay.